Good morning, First Baptist. Good morning. It is that time to worship. Yeah. Amen. And one of the things we enjoy doing is worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we all can stand this morning, and we're going to start off with a hymnal. It is well, and I would like for everyone to sing out as if they actually be singing the lead to the song. All right, so we're going to sing out.
God some praise this morning. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. The only reason he died on the cross for us is because he considered us friends. Amen. Amen. So come on. Let's worship him this morning. Let's shake off the cobweb and worship him. Give him all the honor and glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because we are his friend, today we can give ourselves away. Because it's nothing for what he have done for us. I thank God that he has kept me all these years and he's continued to keep me. I thank God for his power and his love that he's been hovering around me and as we sing this morning. It's nothing for us to give ourselves back to him.
may be seated. Andy Belgrove is our deacon of the week, and he's going to pray for our morning offering if our ushers would come forward at this time. singing the song earlier, Give Myself Away. You know, God, Jesus came onto the earth and set an example that he gave his one and only begotten son. God gave his one and only begotten son, which is Jesus Christ. He gave his all. Amen? Amen. He gave everything he had, his one and only. And I'm looking at at, at, at Brother Ryan right now, and I'm seeing he got four. So maybe he might think about giving one, you know. But when you got one and only, we're not going to do that. Right? Right, Pastor? But you got one, right? We're not going to do that. But he gave his one and only for us. He set an example for us. And that's why the song that we sang, I Give Myself Away, is that we can give our all back to him. And he will do whatever we ask. If we give it our all. Brother Randolph preached last week, and he said the one thing, the one thing that pastor preached a couple weeks ago that we are holding up in the air if we give that one thing to him. Everything will be taken care of. Sometimes we hold on to our money. We hold on to our time. We hold on to whatever we think is the most important thing in our lives. But he's asking to give everything to him. Right. So I'm just going to ask you this morning, give him your all. Give him your all. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for providing. Thank you for healing. Thank you for comforting. Thank you for doing whatever each and every person in this congregation needs this morning. We want to say thank you. Oh Lord, as we are about to receive the tithes and offering unto your name, we pray, oh God, that you will bless it. Use it, oh God, to further your kingdom. Use it, oh God, to further your work. Use it, oh God, as you see it fit to be used. And use your servants, O oh God, that they will know how to use it and what to use it for. Oh Lord, we just want to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. For there is none like unto you. In your name, amen. Uh, Fall Fest is coming up very, very quickly. Uh, and we really beg you to bring in uh, candy donations and make financial donations right now. Start doing those things immediately because even though it's two months away, actually less than that now, seven weeks away, it comes very fast. And last year, we were short on candy and the, and the church had to purchase some to make up the difference. So if you'll start bringing it in now, it would be of a great help to us. And also, if you would prefer to give a financial donation, just designate it on your envelope, the amount for Fall Fest, and it will go to help us cover some of the expenses 
uh, of this big event in the life of the church where um, a thousand people from the community come out every year. And uh, we are working on making it even more evangelistic this year than it has been in years past. There's always been a, a strong element of sharing the gospel in Fall Festival, but we want to do even more so this year. So help us reach over a thousand people in our community. Um, the majority, I would say, probably uh, are from the community, not even from the church. So this is a great outreach opportunity uh, for us. And begin praying about whether you want to volunteer to help us pull off this big event, because it takes a lot of volunteers but it's very, very rewarding. Well, if you've got your Bibles, turn over to Philippians chapter 3, kind of our base verse for the series we've been in called Knowing the Unknowable God. Turn over to Philippians 3, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But if we are to know God better, then we need to know Jesus Christ better. Because Jesus was God in the flesh, come to reveal to us God in a way that we can comprehend. So if we want to understand and, and uh, experience on a fuller level Almighty God, then we must um, understand and experience the Lord Jesus Christ on a deeper level in our lives. And the Apostle Paul had an intense an intense desire to know Christ better because he knew it would allow him to understand God better and he knew it would propel him forward in his ultimate goal of being conformed to the image of Christ. And so Paul had an intense longing to go beyond his initial salvation experience and to know Christ on a much deeper level. So let's take a look at what Paul says about gaining a deeper knowledge of Christ. But I want to make a little clarification first. When Paul says, I want to know Christ, he's not just talking about um, uh, an intellectual knowledge of Christ. Not that that isn't important also. We need to understand on an intellectual level who Christ is. We need to be able to be familiar with the scriptures and quote scripture verses. Uh, we need to be able to defend our faith uh, to those who would say that we are misguided. But what Paul was looking for was not just that, but he wanted a deep experiential knowledge of Christ. All right, He wanted a daily fellowship, a daily experience with his Lord on a deeper level. Not just a head knowledge, but he wanted a heart knowledge, an experience in everyday life to the deepest level that he could get at this side of heaven. Because he knew that it would allow him to understand our infinite God and it would propel him forward to being conformed to the image of his Lord that would be finally complete and perfected when he stood before him. So let's take a look at Philippians 3. We're going to uh, start with verse 7. Um, just to kind of give you some background and understanding of what the Apostle Paul was speaking about. Paul writes to the church at Philippi and he says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul wanted to experience the transforming, sanctifying power of Christ's resurrection in his life. 
so that he could become more and more like his Lord, conformed on a deeper level to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says there that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the transforming, sanctifying power of Jesus, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that transforms us into the image of Christ. And he also says, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Paul wanted to experience intimate fellowship with Christ. Remember, we're talking about an experiential understanding and knowledge of Jesus, not just the head knowledge. And Paul knew that the best way to truly have an experiential knowledge of Christ is to suffer for his faith the way that Christ suffered for his. And so despite how difficult it is, Paul welcomed the sufferings of the faith because he knew then he would have a unity, a fellowship with Christ that he could not experience if there was never any trials and tribulations in his life. So he says, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. See, when we suffer for our commitment to Christ, then we begin to get an understanding of what it was to be Christ as he walked this earth and was committed for his faith and his work for the Lord. And if we never suffer for our faith, we never have that deeper understanding of who Jesus was and what it was like for Jesus to walk this earth. Amen. But then Paul goes on this morning and he says, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul says, I want to become like Christ in his death. Well, what in the world was Paul talking about there? I mean, was Paul saying that I want to die on a cross the way that Jesus did? Uh, Peter died crucified upside down. Because of his commitment to the Lord. Is that what Paul was talking about? Is that he wanted to die just like Jesus did? No, not exactly. He had something a little bit different in mind when he said, I want to become like Christ in his death. And the key to understanding what Paul was talking about, I believe that we find in Paul's uh, uh, second chapter to the Philippians. So if you've got your Bibles open, turn just back a page to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 11. And then we'll begin to understand why Paul says that I want to become like Christ in his death. So let's take a look at what Paul wrote in the second chapter, verses 4 through 11. And Paul says this to the believers at Philippi. And ladies and gentlemen, you can take this like, Christ, or like Paul was writing to us, at the church at Poinciana, just like Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. Because God's word is for all of us. It's timeless. It's relevant for all of us. Amen. So you could kind of say Paul was writing to First Baptist Poinciana, just like he was writing to the church at Philippi. All right? So look what he says there to the believers. He says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We're starting to get an idea now through that statement what Paul was talking about. When he said, I want to be like Christ in his death, he was saying basically, I want to have the same kind of attitude, the same kind of qualities that were revealed in Christ at his death. Now look at what he says. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, something to be held on to. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Boy, we've been talking a lot on Wednesday nights about humility. And here it is again, the importance of of believers humbling themselves before God just as Jesus humbled himself. And Paul says, in being found in appearance of him as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, dear, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So when Paul said, I want to become like Christ in his death, what was he saying? He was saying that I want people to say of me and to see in me the same kind of qualities that were displayed in Christ by his death on the cross. In other words, as he said earlier, I want the same kind of attitude to be found in me in my life as was found in Christ at his death at the cross. So what we've got to answer then, what is it that we see in Christ at his death on the cross that helps us understand what Paul desired for his own life? Because Paul just wanted to be like his Lord. And every believer should have the same desire. We should all want to be like Jesus to the greatest extent that we can this side of heaven. And that's what Paul was saying, is I want to be like Jesus was at his death. And so what do we find revealed about Jesus as he died on the cross? Well, a couple of things, and we see it all contained here in chapter 2, is this was revealed about Jesus as he died on the cross. Number one is that he was a servant. He was a servant. Look at verse 7 again. Jesus, who was God, the eternal word of God, came to earth robed in flesh that he might become, look at verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. The Lord of glory, the King of kings, the eternal word of God, emptied himself, became flesh and blood, and took on the nature of a servant. Left his throne in heaven to become like one of us in order to serve God and us. Now imagine that, a king coming to serve those who dwell in his kingdom. A king letting go of all of his, his majesty in heaven to become like one of us, humanity. And the reason Jesus did that is because he was a servant. A servant of you and I, a servant of his Father in heaven. And so as we see Jesus dying on the cross, come to the end of his life, we see the ultimate example of Christ's love and compassion for humanity. We see the greatest example possible of God becoming a servant of man in order that we might experience forgiveness of sins and have eternal life. And he had no compulsion to have to do that. We were sinners. We had turned our back on God. We had said, we don't want anything to do with you and your ways, Lord. But because God loved us so much, he took on the nature of a servant and died a horrible death on the cross in order to take away our sin so that he could have fellowship with us for all of eternity. And so when we think of Jesus dying on the cross, what we need to think of is Jesus was a servant. Yes. A servant to us and a servant to his father. I read a really interesting story that uh, when Abraham Lincoln's body was brought from uh, Washington to his home state of Illinois, it passed through Albany. And the crowds gathered in the streets to get a glimpse of, of Abraham Lincoln's body as it went through the streets of, of Albany. And it is said that there was a, a black lady who uh, stood up on the curb and picked up her little son and lifted him up as high as, as she could so he could see uh, the, uh, over the heads of the onlookers so that he could get a glimpse of Abraham Lincoln's body. And then she was heard saying this statement, Take a long look, honey. He died for you. Abraham Lincoln gave up his life 
in order to set people free from slavery. Jesus gave up his life to set us free from slavery to sin. Amen. That we might have eternal life. Jesus gave the ultimate act of servanthood. When he left his throne in heaven, became flesh and blood, and died for us. If it wasn't for us and man's sin, Jesus would have never had to die on the cross. It was all because of us and our actions and our rebellion toward the Lord that he had to die. Amen. He didn't have to, but he wanted to because he wanted to save us. And so we see on the cross Jesus as a servant to humanity. And that's what Paul wanted to be seen in his life. That's the kind of character that Paul wanted to be seen in his life. He wanted to be a servant of God and a servant of others. And you know what? The Apostle Paul succeeded in that. Because the Apostle Paul was martyred for his faith. He died on, uh, or in a Roman prison, in his second Roman imprisonment. This isn't the only time he's been in prison. But on a second Roman imprisonment, the Apostle Paul died for his faith. And tradition tells us he was beheaded because of his commitment to Christ. See, the Apostle Paul didn't mince words. He wasn't embarrassed of who he was. He went around preaching the gospel everywhere that he went. He went around planting churches in pagan lands despite the threat upon his life. And he continued to do it right up to the very end and it led to his death. And so you see, the Apostle Paul succeeded in his desire there in Philippians chapter 3 that he became like Christ in his death by being a servant to God and others right up to the very end. See, Paul longed to be a servant like his Lord. And the fact that he died for his commitment to Christ showed that he was a servant to God first and to all those he shared the gospel with, becoming like him in his death. But there's something else that we find revealed about our Lord Jesus Christ in his death on the cross. We find it in verse 8 of chapter 2. And look at what Paul says there. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ's death showed us that he was obedient to his Father to the very end. Despite all the temptations not to be, despite the horrors of the cross that were awaiting him, and we see how heavily that weighed on his mind as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and the, the sweat ran like blood as corpuscles broke in his face and his arms because of the intensity of But yet despite the horrific nature of a death on a cross, Jesus was still obedient to what his father asked him to do. See, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest act of obedience is when you're asked to give up your life for someone else and you do it. Our Father in Heaven asked His Son, Jesus Christ, to give up His life for you and I. And He did it. Regardless of how hard it was going to be, regardless of the incredible sacrifice, and it wasn't just uh, a physical sacrifice. I mean, if you can imagine dying on a cross the way that Jesus did, hanging on a cross for six hours, gasping for breath, with a crown of thorns on your head after being beaten with whips to where the, the, the flesh hung like ribbons, having nails driven in your hands and your feet. But it wasn't just that suffering, but he also had the sin of all humanity heaped upon him. Paul said he became sin for us. And so all of man's disgusting filthiness was heaped upon Jesus Christ and he experienced separation from his Father for the first time in all of eternity because he had become sin for us. Taking the penalty that we deserve for our sin in order that we might gain his righteousness and have eternal life. Amen. And so despite all of that, knowing what was coming... 
Jesus was obedient to the request of his father. If we're going to save humanity, you must go pay the penalty for them. And Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. The ultimate act of obedience. And you see, that's what Paul wanted to be said of him when he came to the end of his life, that he was obedient to his Father in heaven. Despite the cost, despite how difficult it might be, he wanted to be found obedient. He wanted the sufferings of Christ, he wanted the power of the resurrection to work in him that quality of being obedient to God no matter what. Amen. Becoming like him in his death. Because the ultimate act of obedience is to give your life for someone else when you're asked, asked to. Jesus gave his life for us because his father asked him. And Paul gave his life for his commitment to his Lord. And so Paul wanted to become like him in his death. And you know what? Again, he succeeded in being obedient as Jesus was obedient. If you still got your Bibles open, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to get a little glimpse of the final days of the Apostle Paul's life. And we're going to see that he succeeded in his desire from Philippians uh, chapter 3. That he desired to become like Christ in his death. To be a servant. To be obedient completely, even to the point of death, to his Lord. And look what Paul says beginning with verse 6. He writes to Timothy, a young minister in the gospel who had been mentored by the Apostle Paul and was helping Paul in his ministries to the churches. And he writes to Timothy and he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul wrote to Timothy in the Mamertine prison, deepest, darkest, nastiest dungeon there could be, in a Roman dungeon, and he said, Timothy, my death is imminent. It's coming soon. My life, my ministry is coming to a close. But he knew in his mind that he could look back over 30 years of being committed to the Lord, 30 years of ministry, and be able to say, as he drew his last breath, as the sword was about to come down and behead him, that I was a servant of God and others, and I was obedient to what God asked me to do to the very end, becoming like him in his death. And so he could say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He was a servant and he was obedient, just like his Lord, to the very last breath. When you come to the end of your life, when you know death is, is imminent, will you be able to say along with the Apostle Paul that I was a servant of others and of the Most High God? Will you be able to say that I was obedient to whatever my Lord asked me to do? And if when you come to your dying breath, if you're able to say that, that I have become like him in his death, a servant and obedient, then you'll be able to say, I know Christ better. And you'll have a great expectation well up inside of your heart of what is about to come next. And that is to experience God in his full glory. Amen. Death is going to come to every one of us. Yes. 
And I want to be able to say along with the Apostle Paul as I draw my last breath that I have become like him in his death. Amen. A servant and obedient to anything and everything that my Lord asked of me. Yes. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to serve you. The world tells us that the life is all about us. How much we can gather, how much we can store up, how much we can get for ourselves. But the timeless truth of your word says that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the servant of all. The one who sacrifices. The one who is obedient to you. So Lord, I pray that every person in this room, young and old alike, Lord, will be able to say, along with the Apostle Paul, when they come to the end of their life, that we have become like Christ in his death. Obedient servants. And when we do that, then we'll have that deeper knowledge of Christ that we have longed. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Here's the invitation for this morning. Is you can't know Christ better until you know him to start with. Amen. And the way you get to know Christ to start with is by surrendering your life to him as Lord and Savior. Believing he died on the cross for your sins. Repenting of your sins and following after him. And when you do that, your sins are all washed away. You gain eternal life. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside you. And then life really begins. But then it's, it's a journey. In coming to know Christ better on a deeper level, experiencing more of what God has for you. And what that requires sacrifice and service. It requires obedience to whatever the Lord asks you to do. So if you really want to know Christ, come forward, we'll introduce you to him so you can get started on this incredible journey. If you already know Christ and you want to know him better, then you need to seek the power of his resurrection in your life. You need to seek the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings and desire to become like him in his death, a servant and obedient to your Lord. Then you will know Christ as you've never known him before. Amen. We'll pray with you about that. Or maybe you just need to come to the altar and just get alone with God and say, Lord, I've been playing around, man. I, I, I got saved. I know I'm going to heaven, but then I haven't done anything else. I want to know you better. And I know it comes with a cost. I know it requires sacrifice and obedience. It, I know it requires me to be a servant of you and others. But I can't think of anything greater, as the Apostle Paul said. I can't believe the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I know that's waiting for me, and I want it. I want that surpassing greatness of knowing you. And God will honor that. And will help you along your journey. Will you come forward as we sing a song of invitation? And however God leads you, um, respond. All right. God has your best in mind.